my brother and my mother uh, went in on a, on a cheap bass guitar when I was about 12. And so I got my first bass about 12 or 13 for like a Christmas present or something. No case, you know. It's an old KSG body bass. You, know? you consider that your first axe? Yeah, yeah. One of my cousins, uh, J.R. Wright, it was his name, bought me an old Stella guitar when I was about 14. And of course it was hard to play and, and there wasn't any music teachers around and there wasn't any music store to buy the music from. And so I went, I went to these shoot 'em ups every Saturday at matinees, you know, and the old Tex Ritter, I watched him make a C card on his, on his guitar and I went home and of course I had a neighbor, neighbor that could tune it, you know, and it was in tune pretty good. And, uh, and I'm putting my fingers where I thought he put his, and it made a chord sound, you know. I was like, hmm. You know, I, th I was thinking I was going to get a horn for Christmas for some reason, man. And, uh, like. You first had asked her in October, so yeah, you yeah. were I thought I was going to get it for Christmas. December horn gift. Yeah, and that Christmas, you know, I wake up, and, you know, we have Christmas and everything, and no horn. And I'm sitting there going, I, you know, I mean, I wasn't being greedy or nothing, but I thought I knew, you know what I mean? I thought I had the feeling, and, and Christmas is over, and everybody's like, all right, clean up the paper. And, dude, it was totally out of the Christmas story. It was like, my mom's like, what's that over there? <laughs> and I look, dude, and there's this black case sticking out from behind the door, not even wrapped, dude. Uh, so I, like, run over to it and open it, and it's like a shiny, brand-new tenor sax, and it's the best brand. Oh, my. You know, and I'm just like shitting golden bricks <laughs> and mom looks at me and goes if you promise to stick with it you know here's your saxophone and I got you a good one where you'll never have to sell it or get rid of it but you gotta promise to stick with it and I did <laughs> one summer I went nuts and my parents trusted me with one of their bank accounts and I would uh, peel a couple of hundred dollars off the top every every four weeks, you know, once a month, and I'd saved enough money to buy me an electric guitar and uh, uh, get the band some t-shirts. <laughs> Jack's Garage Band, God dog, man, it's not bragging though, man, I hurt a lot, that hurts when you put, somebody puts their trust in you that much, but for some reason, man, I thought that I deserved it, man, and that's one thing that comes with thinking that you're going to be a musician and being told that you're that special all your life, all of a sudden you're not getting it, and for a little bit you'll take it, man, and that's where your ego, it makes you very, very humble, especially you realize that that was so long ago and um, how much hurt there's been after that. It's actually in ninth grade, <clears throat> I cut my hair to work at Bill Miller's because they had at the time, if you were a dishwasher. The barbecue place? Bill yes. <laughs> uh, they had like at the time, minimum wage for them was a little higher. I don't know, they had little signs that made me kind of go in there and I did it. And it was just basically, you know, it was like to get a drum set, I did it for three three months, and it was all good, but they just didn't appreciate, you know, you'd be there scrubbing, they're like, you know, get busier, you know, and it was just like, you couldn't ever do enough for them, and, um, but it got me my first kid, it was a Tama, double bass, kind of Tommy Aldridge-ish, I kind of started off with double bass, but soon threw that thing out there, but, um, yeah, I worked at Bill Miller's, and it was funny, too, because at school, when I, when I did all that, and it was the talk of the whole, because, you know, it's been years since, Jimmy got his hair cut. <laughs> that was the whole talk of the school. I said, I totally remember it. It's funny. But you know, hair grows, man. I think it was my 15th or 16th birthday I got the guitar. For a gift? Or... Yeah, my birthday present. Me and my mom and dad went to, we had to go to, was it to Topeka? I think we had to go to Topeka to a go to a music. City. Yeah, we had to go to a different city to, to get the guitar. The first band that I formed was a band called uh, um, GPK, I think. And what did that stand for? <laughs> uh, nothing. <laughs> Come on. No, no, no. We won't. It's GPK. Anyway, uh, the first band I was ever in was called Rampage. <laughs> okay, this is really good. When I was in junior high, 
um, I had a, a bunch of girlfriends of mine. We were all really, really into Duran Duran, and we needed to figure out the best way to marry our particular favorite members of Duran Duran. And we decided that being in a band would be the best way to marry our, I was gonna marry John Taylor. So bass player. Bass player, yeah, he was good. <laughs> so yeah, we, we formed this band, it was called Pink Sweat. And we had the logo, you know, we drew it on our notebooks. We had this great, it was kind of like the Def Leppard logo. And so we, and then we decided who was gonna play what. And so we all decided on our instruments and what the band was going to be about. We had, you know, just built up the whole band thing in our minds, and then we decided then we were actually going to get instruments. I played in a group called uh, Panhandle Playboys. <laughs> Guillotine. I'm trying to remember if we had a name. What? So you might, you might have gigged as a band without a name? Yeah, I think we had a name, but... I can't remember. Yeah, uh, besides maybe like jamming with dad and practice, yeah, my first band was Pariah. Wow. Yeah, because yeah, it started in, like I said, I was 15, uh, 15, 16, graduated when I was 18 and 19, and we started in 85, 86, started really doing good about 88, 89, 90. And uh, yeah, that was my first band. Pariah wow. is my first band. GPK, yeah. And you're not going to no not, comment no on No comment that? on what it stands for. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> Must be pretty damn bad. It's, no, it's, it's not, it's nothing. Anyway, <laughs> next question. <laughs> What were your personal goals at the age of 15 through 19? Rock star. <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, to do as many drugs as I possibly could, drink myself into a stupor, and uh, hopefully wake up the next morning, you know, <laughs> and start over again. I was a teenager, and I knew it, and I took advantage of it, you know? Goals at 15 to 19, you know, I just, it wasn't about uh, money or anything like that. It was. It was all just about being in a band. I just wanted to play rock and roll. I didn't care what kind of world it was. I didn't care about any kind of business. I didn't know. You know, at that age, you don't know. You don't care. You don't, you know. I was doing it in the garage, and I was fine with that. So there was no goal. The only, the only goals I had were to make, you know, uh, pray that my amp didn't blow that night. Oh, I wanted to be on the Grand Ole Opry. And I wanted to play at Kane's Ballroom, where Bob Wells played. So I got to play Kane's Ballroom several times, and I've been on the Grand Ole Opry twice, so I've met some of my goals in life. Yeah. Basically, from 15 to 19, I was doing the pariah thing and just trying to get it going, and then we finally got signed in 90 when I was 20, so... Just, you were ready to rock. Yeah, I learned a lot about myself, you know, as a, as a black man, you know, my culture, you know, um, it was it was a very it was a time when I was just trying to get caught up, and stuff started to matter. Being a band, tour the world, and get laid, and do nothing but party, and live that way, and just party all the time, but be legit about it. <laughs> you know, we were rock and roll, baby. <laughs> and there was never, a, never a doubt, man. Never a doubt in my. You know what the doubt was, and where that came whenever I turned twenty, and I hadn't had my gold album yet, and I haven't had. I moved to Austin when I was fifteen years old. I'd given it five years, no clue why. I haven't made it yet. I was ready to. I remember tripping acid over off of uh, one of the cliffs over off 2222 and taking my car and just really, really expecting at that age to be able to drive off of it or into it and me go down as a legend. That's what I was ready for. And then all of a sudden, boom, you turn 21 and what do you got? Another fucking demo in your pocket. You know what I mean? And nobody, and all of a sudden, man, it started going all right, man. What's, what's going on? But uh, between 15 and 20, it wasn't school. It was, it was about jamming.
<laughs> Pull over, dude. Turn it up. That's you know, up can't me. believe it. Hey, I'm on the radio. You know, and I didn't really do it. I was just like, you know, it's a little bit and all. Like it wasn't really happening. It's and I just could, I couldn't stop staring at the the radio dial. I literally had to pull the car over, put it in park, turn it up, and just sit there and stare at it. Everybody's hearing me right now. Well, it was really neat. We. The first time was in La Mesa. We had a radio program on, on Saturday afternoon back in the 50s. And I still got part of one of those old radio programs on. I, I got it on reel to reel, but I got, also got it on a little cassette tape, you know, that I taped off on it one time. And every once in a while I'll drag it out and listen to it. It's something we did in about 1953 or four or something like that. I was at the station and just you know, seeing like a jam box tuned to the station across the room with a cassette in it because you're taping it <laughs> so you can of listen course. to it. So you can listen to it later. That that was like a a big deal, you know. So you could go, hey, here's me on the radio, you know, wow. That night party and drinking some beers, doing whatever we do, and then we're like, oh man, wait a minute, it's like, you know, nine fifty it's it's time to listen to our cut. So we turn on the radio and it's like some other station. So, and, and literally, dude, we start hunting through the dial. It's like, da, 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 and then us. We, we found the right station by hearing our music come through the static. And I'm just like, I was blown completely away. The first time I heard my own commercial going into another town, you know, and you hear, you know, uh, <laughs> on the rock and roll tonight, tonight, straight from Austin, Texas, and then you've got your CD playing in the background, you know. Oh, yeah. Squish, squish. Yeah, it was great. It's, uh, it's a really cool feeling because you want to call up all your friends and say, I'm on the radio. And uh, you've got three minutes. <laughs> yeah. To do it. But if they're playing it in rotation for yeah. a while, they, you know, you can say, hey, listen to, you know, the radio station, it'll be on. They do. And oh, I heard it. I remember riding around in a car and uh, I was, we were going downtown, in fact, and we turned on the radio and uh, I can't remember what it was that was playing. Um, it was like Rescue 917 radio show or something like that. And right in Hyde Park came on. I was like, this is cool, you know? <laughs> This is very cool. Too bad no one's probably listening to the station, but this is still cool. Yeah. Did you have anyone in the car with you? Yeah, there was like a couple other people. We were just drunk and stoned and laughing. It was funny, yeah. I don't know if we, no, we hadn't played yet. We got to Seattle a day early and we hooked up with some, uh, some friends of a friend and we're staying up there and they were like, oh, let's go swimming in, uh, in the lake. And I was like, cool, and we all piled in this car and we had the radio station turned on. It was like late night, naked swimming style. And uh, it was like maybe like one in the morning and they played Here Come the Warm Jets and they're like, yeah, 16 Deluxe is playing tomorrow. I was just like, damn, man, I'm in Seattle. I'm gonna go skinny dipping in the lake. That was my first rock tour and it was like hearing that. It was just like, it just, it felt really right. It was like, all right, yeah, rock stars, you know. As a solo acoustic performer, uh, to hear some of my stuff on even this little local lick sing uh, here about three weeks ago, and to be able to just crank it up and know that, man, that sounds fucking kick ass, yeah. you know? Kept up, you blew away, or in your mind, blew away the band that was before you, that's for sure, buddy, you know, it's the best ever.